The Earth and the Moon contain an insanely high amount of rotational energy compared to every other planet in the solar system. And this 4.5 billion years old planet embryo might be the reason why that's happened. It might also be the reason why Earth is the only planet in the solar system that still has active earthquakes. It might be the reason for which we have water, for which there are two giant continent-sized masses spanning thousands of kilometers hiding deep within Earth's mantle. It is probably involved in the birth of the moon and it's the reason why the Earth and the moon share a unique chemical signature, something akin to planet's DNA that is found nowhere else on any other planet, meteor, comet, whatever in the solar system. Am I finally losing it? Probably. But this is a four and a half billion years old mystery. And in the past 10 years, among crazy theories, like saying that the moon is actually this little protoplanet in disguise, we have made insane progress in answering what's possibly our planet's oldest question. This is the mystery of Theia. In ancient Greek mythology, Theia was one of the titans. She had a brother named Hyperion, and they had a child, and she was the goddess of the moon. So when I tell you that that little protoplanet is called Theia, well, you can kind of guess what I'm hinting at. And by the way, uh, it's not in the official folklore of Greek mythology, but um, I'm quite sure that Hyperion and Theia moved to Alabama in their later years. Now, by a lot of astronomers, Theia is believed to be the cause of all the things I just rambled about a few moments ago. As I was saying, Earth is the only planet with plate tectonics earthquakes, and the two hidden masses residing deep within our mantle might be the cause. These are called LLSVPs, or LSVPs for short. They also have human-like names, they're called Tuzo and Jason. Now, these are as big as continents. They span several thousands of kilometers across, and they extend outwards from the core mantle boundary, the layer separation between uh, two of the inner sections of our planet, for up to a thousand kilometers. One theory on their formation states that they might be remnants of Theia's core which ended up here after an incredibly violent impact with the protoplanet four and a half billion years ago. This is just a hundred million years after the solar system was born, okay? This is something that happened in what is, cosmically speaking, the youth of our system. Now, everyone seems to believe that if Theia existed, it was probably a protoplanet. Basically, a celestial body in... Fuck you! <coughs> Essentially, a celestial body in the process of accumulating enough material to become a big boy planet, a real grown-up planet. <laughs> Yo! Now, there's lots of quite heated disagreements on the specifics, even on more uh, generic and basic details. For example, the size of Theia is estimated to have been between 10 and 45% of our current Earth by mass. Even by the most conservative estimates, 10% of the Earth's mass is something as big as Mars colliding with us. Something that big, even if it was just Mars-sized, would make the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs look like a pebble. One of the theories on the origin of the LSVPs, LLSVPs is that once Theia hit the planet, two very big chunk of its core sunk deep into the Earth's mantle, which are the actual LSVPs. Now, as these guys sunk deep into our planet, they displaced lots of material, causing what are called plumes, so raising chunks of material bubbling up to the surface. This, in turn, started displacing the Earth's crust. It broke it into chunks, or plates, which is what started plate tectonics and subduction. The process of having multiple parts of the Earth's crust collide... The process of having multiple parts of the Earth's crust collide and one part sliding below another. That's the origin of earthquakes. And by the way, that's an insane amount of energy, okay? That is an impact so strong that four and a half billion years later, we are still physically shaken by it. So if that theory were to be true, it would be a quite mind-blowing finding. Now, why are they called 
Lewis Whoops. Well, it's actually tied on how we discovered them. When you experience an earthquake, some of the energy comes in the form of body waves, actual uh, waves of energy, of motion that travel through the planet's body. Now, the waves actually come in two waves. So it basically means that whenever you experience an earthquake, you usually get shaken twice. The first time you are hit by the P waves, the fastest traveling waves. These are waves that pretty much compress the terrain as they travel outwards. You can picture this as uh, standing at the back of a very long queue and shoving the mother right in front of you. And what you would see from an outside perspective is people pushing one another. So at every, at every given moment, you have this pocket of compressed people, right, hitting one another, traveling forward. Then you have slower traveling waves that reach you later. These are called S waves or shear waves. Remember this name. As these travel outwards, these waves actually shake the terrain side by side in what's called a shearing motion. The way LLSVPs were found is through shear waves. That's because LLSVP stands for Large Low Shear Velocity Provinces. So these are large provinces, large blocks of material, continent sized, as I just told you, that have a low shear velocity. It basically means that S waves travel through these chunks of terrain slower than usual. And so by noticing abnormalities in the, in the delay between P and S waves to a very complex process called tomography, which is super deeply involved, scientists of various kinds managed to map out the shape and size of these two blobs and it's spelled sheer with an a not sheer like the sheer chick i have to ask you to hype this video using the new youtube hype feature or maybe just leave a like and subscribe and ring the bell for notification because there's 11,000 people down below and they don't watch this shit <sighs> Thank you! Now, there's uh, a few more very complex alternative hypotheses on the origin of LLSVPs, but I couldn't be bothered with them. I quite literally skipped the Wikipedia section containing the information on that because it didn't fit my narrative. And if the theory I just told you were true, it would fit very neatly into the Theia Earth Impact Theory. Because there are so many more seemingly unrelated aspects of this theory that come together. For example, let's talk about isotopes. This is an oxygen atom, or at least it is the most common oxygen atom you can find on our planet. 99.76% of all oxygen on the planet is O16, oxygen 16. The 16 comes from the fact that this oxygen atom has 8 protons and 8 neutrons. 8 plus 8. Now, if you add an extra neutron, you obtain another isotope, another variant of oxygen. It's called oxygen 17. Guess what the f happens when you add yet another neutron? Oh my fucking god, it's oxygen 18! Now, you can get pretty much unique chemical signature of the different celestial bodies in our solar system if you take the ratios of different isotopes. For example, if you take the ratio between the number of oxygen-17 atoms and oxygen-16 atoms found in Earth's ancient rocks, you won't find that exact ratio anywhere else. Except on the f moon. And the same holds for the ratio between oxygen-18 and oxygen-16 atoms. It's believed that every other planet, moon, asteroid in the solar system has a ratio that differs by at least a few dozen parts per million, and sometimes it might differ by a hundred parts per million. Do you want to know what the difference between Earth's and Moon's ratios is? Let me pull it up, because I didn't write it in the video script. Initial studies put this difference at around plus or minus three parts per million. A 2024 study puts this difference at less than 1.5 parts per million. That is at the very least one order of magnitude closer than every other celestial body in our solar system is. Another piece of the giant Theia puzzle is that the moon is hypothesized to have had a molten surface. Now, to have something like that, you need to get a lot of energy from somewhere. And a gigantic impact between two huge masses could give you just that. But the collision theory is not so simple, you know? Like a, a toxic My Little Pony fandom, proponents of the theory argue and, uh, and punch each other over the pettiest little details. For example, was the collision with Theia a head-on collision? And uh, 
I can't believe what I just wrote in my script. So, because what I, what I should say now is, at first, it was not believed to be the case. It was believed to be a grazing impact, a sideswipe. But now, and listen to this, everyone be like woof, 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 yeah, because of synestias. What does that mean? Yeah, initially no one believed it, but now um, there's proponents of this theory too, because uh, they believe that if Thea and Hurt had a head-on collision, the Earth wouldn't have quite disintegrated, but rather it would have formed a synestia, a relatively new cosmic structure that was proposed in 2017 after extensive computer simulations. You can imagine it as a cosmic donut that spins really fast and that you can um, subdivide into three regions. The innermost region is called the co-rotating region, a single solid mass, really really hot, spinning really really fast. Then you have the transition region, which gets gradually colder and slower the further away you go from the center, and then you have the what the f is that called? The disc-like region. The coldest and slowest spinning part, whose size, temperature and rotational energy uh, is extremely dependent on the initial conditions of the collision, so we have no conclusive ideas on how it might have looked. Before we close this chapter, what I told you moments ago about uh, the isotope ratios being nearly identical, well, it was later discovered that it might have been a bit of a misguided observation, because uh, we got our moon measurements from all of the uh, lunar rock samples that we got from the various Apollo missions. Now, if you average the chemical composition of all the rocks, that average comes very close to Earth's average. But if you take the concentrations of every individual sample we have from the moon, and the concentration of many samples you can get from around Earth, and you put them on a plot, you can see that while the average is pretty close, the moon has a, a much more varied distribution of concentrations. This might be explained by the synestia hypothesis. An alternative variant of this uh, theory states that when the Earth and Moon collided, there wasn't actually a full-on meltdown. Like, the core of the Earth might have remained cooler, and so the Moon might actually be mostly Theia, rather than Earth and Theia in equal amounts, even though Theia was a lot smaller than Earth. The wildest speculations even state that the moon, our current moon, the one you can look at tonight, might be between 70 and 90 percent Theia. And another bit of um, evidence that would be corroborated by assuming that the Earth and Theia didn't fully mix is the presence of LLSVPs. Had there been a complete meltdown, those chunks would have been just melted and mixed into the Earth. Now there's still infighting within the fandom about the temperature of the collision itself. For example, the Earth's iron core is much bigger than the Moon's iron core, even if you account for their relative sizes, the Moon has a much smaller core. And also we found some traces of water into lunar basalt, which would be a lot harder to explain if the Moon truly had a molten surface for a time. It gets kind of shady when you start looking deeper, it gets very confusing and very unclear. Am I still recording? If my phone stopped recording, I'm gonna come in. What about Theia itself? Where did it even come from? Some say it came from deep space, some others say it might have come from either the L4 or the L5 Lagrange points relative to the Earth and the Sun. What are those though? What am I talking about? <laughs> Basically, when you have two objects in space, like the Sun and the Earth. You are going to experience gravitational attraction from the both of them. Like say you were a lonely little meteor, okay, traveling through the solar system, you would actually be pulled by both the Earth and the Sun. Now, uh, the laws of gravitational attractions tell us that the gravitational pull you experience from a celestial body is greater the bigger its mass and the closer you are to it. That implies that if you had two celestial bodies pulling on you with their gravitational attraction, uh, like the Sun and the Earth, you might find some points of equilibrium, points in which the gravitational attraction from both cancels out, and in those points you could maintain a relatively stable position. Now we know that there exist several such Lagrange points, and they are numbered, with L1 for example being the simplest one. You are exactly at some point in the line that connects the Sun and the Earth, and if you p position yourself at the right distance, you you're gonna get pulled from one side and the other in equal amounts, and that's gonna make you stable. There's other Lagrange points that seem a bit counterintuitive, but you can 
safely orbit the sun from those positions without being truly bothered. Now, theories believe that Theia might have been at one of the two points between L4 and L5, and at some point, some other planet, like uh, Venus or uh, I don't know, I don't remember, it doesn't matter, some other planet flew by and pulled it out of its Lagrange point, which made it spiral, okay, it, it, it started crashing the fuck out, and at some point, it hit the Earth at crazy high speed. The point is that this theory, despite lots of evidence, backing it up is still kind of maybe up in the air. What I mean to say, it's not been proven with absolute certainty, nor has any other theory on, on the origin of the moon, you know? Some theories claim that the moon just flew by and the Earth pulled on it with its gravitational attraction. Some other theories state that the Earth and the moon formed from uh, the same protoplanetary disk. This would have been a, a particle cloud, a very hot particle cloud that cooled down and stuff started clumping together and two clumps appeared, the Earth and the Moon. This could also explain the very similar chemical composition. Some other theories state that there was a different kind of impact of some sort that generated the Moon. But every one of these more or less credible theories might collapse on themselves tomorrow or 50 years from now. But this is so damn interesting. I feel like we are close to a monumental finding, a monumental discovery about our origins, about, about the place in which we were born. And I can't wait to find out how this will end. It is an historical finding unfolding in front of our very eyes. And there's even a flipping of the traditional scientific approach because you usually perform an experiment by setting up initial conditions and seeing where that leads you. But here, you have the end result. We are the end result. And you need to play around with different parameters, with different scenarios, setups, simulations, to figure out what could have brought us here. And we might even finally find out if the moon truly is 90% made up of Theia. But until then, every time I will look up at the night sky, I will wonder if I'm staring at an imposter in disguise.